Hello, everybody. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday, hosted by the Concrete Preservation Alliance. This is the bridge preservation series that we're hosting um, for the last 10 months now. My name is Scott McCullough, and I'm with Vector Corrosion Technologies here in Winnipeg. Thrilled to be your moderator again uh, today. Um, today, we have a great show for you. Um, on electrochemical treatments to extend the life of corroding substructures with David Whitmore. If you recall, he's joined us before in January for a discussion of post-tension post impregnation. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground in these 10 webinars, and yet though, still to come, our final two of the year in June and, uh, in June and July, uh, our surface applied cathodic protection of, of substructures with Travis Marmon, and a culvert repair using geopolymer mortars with the one and only Garth Fallis. If you have any requests or questions for future webinar topics, uh, we'd love to hear them. Uh, please send an email to communications at wesavestructures.info. Uh, that's the home of the Concrete Preservation Alliance, and we'd love to hear from you as well. The Concrete Preservation Alliance is a growing coalition of organizations committed to advancing best practices in the field of concrete preservation and infrastructure renewal. Uh, we draw on the expertise of our member organizations like Vector Corrosion Technologies, where Dave and I, I work, uh, to present Webinar Wednesday, and we aim at sharing these best practices and innovative approaches to saving structures <coughs> for the benefit of everyone. So as I mentioned, we have a number of members and here's just a quick slide here with our current membership, but it is growing all the time. As I mentioned, the home of the Concrete Preservation Alliance is wesavestructures.info. So if you've registered for this webinar, I'm confident that you've clicked on the events tab. There's a lot of great resources there, uh, which we're also building out currently. Um, this is where all recordings from all of our webinars, all registrations for future events, and the slide decks from every presentation will be will be housed. So please go back there frequently. One other interesting note is um, we have an environmental impact calculator that calculates the um, the various uh, emissions and uh, resource consumption from your decisions in preserving concrete assets like bridges, as you see here. And I encourage you to go back there and look at that because it's interesting to know how uh, how our decisions impact our natural environment. On to the main show here. David Whitmore is the President and Chief Innovation Officer for Vector Corrosion Technologies, a company which specializes in the repair and, and corrosion protection of reinforced concrete structures. So just so we're clear, that makes Dave the head cheese of Vector Corrosion and ultimately my boss, so be kind. <laughs> uh, Dave is a professional engineer, a NACE certified cathodic protection specialist, and he has deep involvement with the American Concrete Institute, um, the, the International Concrete Repair Institute and the National Association of Corrosion Engineers. He's also been involved with the U.S. Federal Highway Administration on the Strategic Highway Research Program, SHARP, as well as SHARP 2, which I'm sure he'll be discussing in a few minutes. Uh, beyond that, Dave's three great loves are his family, the great outdoors, and as I've learned today, electrochemical treatments. <laughs> uh, a close fourth would be fresh carrots from his, his growing garden. There we go. So here, on to Dave. Dave, this is a black and white photo, uh, and I'm concerned it says 1995, but maybe it was 1895 you were doing this project if the photos were in black and white? Oh, hi, Scott. Uh, <laughs> this photo is from 1995, and it's from a project that we did for Virginia DOT and Federal Highway Administration as a demonstration project, and this is from their VDOT Federal Highway report. And unfortunately, everything in the report is black and white. So the only copy of that photo I have is in black and white. Uh, and welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about electrochemical treatments uh, this afternoon. And I would like to cover um, not only the history and the development of these systems, but also the performance of them. And uh, we're gonna focus primarily on electrochemical chloride extraction and uh, realkalization. Um, before we talk about the specific details of the different systems, I wanted to um, start the presentation by kind of leading into it uh, through the Strategic Highway Research Program number two and project R19A. 
um, which I had the privilege uh, to be on about 10, between 10 and 15 years ago now. Um, and this project related to design of new bridges for 100 year plus service life. And another aspect of that project was how do we make existing bridges last for 100 years or more? And uh, this is relevant um, to the topic that we're talking about today because one of the figures that are that are in the guide that you see the front cover of on this slide is uh, figure 5.13. Um, and this figure is specifically about what options are available to address currently corroding, you know, reinforced concrete structures, in this case bridges. And the range of options that exist um, are wide, obviously, there always are, and they go from, you know, doing nothing, i.e. letting the structure continue to deteriorate. That obviously costs the least, but it doesn't give you much benefit in terms of the service life, to things like applying uh, sealers or coatings or waterproofing, some type of treatment, which may reduce the corrosion rate by, say, reducing water in the structure. Um, you may have a strategy which involves removing and replacing portions of the concrete to remove the chloride contaminated or carbonated concrete. And then over on the right, we have two categories, cathodic protection and electrochemical treatments. Um, these are electrochemical techniques whereby you're applying a current to the structure and more specifically to the steel inside the structure for the purpose of either slowing down the corrosion rate or stopping it altogether. And uh, today we're going to focus on the electrochemical treatment area and in a couple of the other uh, uh, webinars that we've had to date and the next one coming up, um, there's lots of information there about cathodic protection, both galvanic and impressed current varieties. So if we look at electrochemical treatments, the principal one that is in use is electrochemical chloride extraction. Um, this is used obviously on chloride contaminated reinforced concrete structures and uh, this system basically has a number of principal uh, components. Uh, one is that it's done as a treatment process. So unlike cathodic protection, which is typically a permanent installation, this is installed temporarily and then it's removed at the end of the treatment. Um, and the system itself consists of um, really three main components. One is a DC power supply, negative side connected to the rebar, positive side connected to the second component, which is the temporary anode. And you'll see some examples of that in the various project examples. And the anode is in contact with the surface of the concrete through some type of conductive media, uh, ionically conductive media, and that's the third uh, principal uh, component of the structure um, or of the this type of system. I mean, when you charge the rebar negatively, you basically cause chloride ions, which are negatively charged, to be repelled away from the rebar and drawn towards this positively charged anode, which is exterior to the concrete surface. And the chlorides tend to accumulate out here, and then they're removed when the system is removed. The other thing that happens when the system runs is that as you pass current through the system, you generate hydroxyl ions on the surface of the steel all the way around, and this creates a zone of increased alkalinity around the rebar, and the combination of reducing the chloride concentration and increasing the alkalinity leads to passivation of the steel and long-term uh, corrosion performance. Um, we're going to talk about this in much more detail, um, but just to give you one slide, um, this is a picture of a project. It's a bridge substructure project uh, that was completed in uh, Omaha, Nebraska uh, back in 1999. And you can see all of the piers of the bridge here where the system has been installed and it's currently operating. And then on the right hand side, you can see after the system is finished and the system's been removed and the concrete is cleaned up and a protective coating or barrier coating is applied to provide aesthetic appearance but also some secondary protection. Uh, you'll see some more details of that when we get into uh, the other case studies. 
The second type of system that we're going to talk about today is electrochemical realkalization. Schematically, this is very, very similar to electrochemical chloride extraction. You have a temporary DC power supply, negative side connected to the rebar, positive side connected to a temporary anode. You have a ionically conductive media, same as chloride extraction. Um, the two principal differences here is that instead of keeping the system wet with water, we use an alkaline electrolyte or an alkaline solution to keep the system wet. And the second thing that's a difference is that the treatment time for this is much shorter. Uh, it doesn't take as long to realkalize concrete as it does for chlorides to migrate out. Um, this type of system is used on carbonated concrete. I'm going to show you a bridge example in the webinar, but before, um, just as an overview, I picked a building example. This is Washington Reagan National Airport in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, uh, we had the good fortune of doing um, realkalization to the entire exterior facade of the Terminal A. Um, the concrete, as you can see in the upper right hand corner, was carbonated and corroding. Uh, the system was applied to all of the exposed concrete surfaces. You can see in the bottom left here. And after the treatment was completed and the system was removed, uh, protective coating was applied to the exposed concrete surfaces and that's the way it remains uh, to today. So that's just a quick overview of the two types of systems that we're going to be talking about. Um, we're now we're going to start by talking in more detail about chloride extraction and I figured the best way to do that was would be to go back to the beginning at least the beginning as far as I'm concerned. Uh, my first exposure to chloride extraction was in 1989. Um, Vector was doing an impressed current cathodic protection project for the Ontario Ministry of Transportation on a portion of the substructure of this bridge, Burlington Skyway. And uh, the Ministry of Transportation decided that they wanted to do a pilot project with chloride extraction on one of the piers of that bridge. Um, this is a picture uh, from 1989, um, which was taken during installation on the on the first and only pier that was done on this bridge. And you can see in this photograph on the left, um, you can see the welded wire mesh. That's the temporary anode that was installed. And you can see the spray applied electrolyte or conductive media, which was essentially a paper mache type material that was used on that project. Um, this was the first project of this type that was done in North America, and uh, it was done during the time that the original Strategic Highway Research Project was going on, and this project ended up being incorporated into the SHARP uh, project as one of the field trials. Um, the Ontario Ministry of Transportation monitored this um, trial project uh, quite intensely, uh, much more than you would do on a typical commercial installation. And uh, you can see, I'm going to show you a few slides just showing some of the data from back then and over time, but um, the blue line in this graph is the original chloride profile in the concrete. Um, the red line it is a chloride uh, profile that was taken during the treatment, approximately three weeks into the treatment. Um, the Purple line down here is at the end of the treatment, which in this case was eight weeks. And then the green line, uh, they went back and took some cores eight years after the chloride extraction treatment was done. And that's the chloride profile eight years after treatment. And you can see that the chloride profile eight years after treatment is pretty much the same as it was when it was completed. Um, chlorides were one of the things that they measured. Um, at certain points in time. Um, they also did uh, visual inspections and at other periods of time they also came back and took other measurements. Um, this picture was from 2009 um, when the Ministry of Transportation was back to do a 20-year evaluation after the work was done and they did 
obviously an assessment for delaminations and spalls and what they're getting set up for in this photograph is the for doing corrosion potential and corrosion rate measurements which they did periodically and uh, I can show you here in the next slide um, uh, some of that data that has been taken over time so uh, I don't expect you to capture all of this data um, but just you can see very clearly that for the treated one of the treated faces um, the south face and the north face of the pier was left as a control it was untreated you can see that the corrosion potentials on the treated face shifted to be in the passive range uh, immediately when it was treated and they have stayed essentially passive um, and you've got essentially 20 years worth of data here um, the control obviously didn't do the same thing and that would be expected um, in terms of corrosion rates um, you can see the same thing you've got one of the treated faces here and the untreated face over here or the control face um, the treated face before treatment was actually corroding slightly faster um, but more or less similarly and you can see that that corrosion rate drops significantly after the treatment and even down at the very end after 20 years it's a fraction you know uh, it says 90 to 95 percent reduction in corrosion rate um, compared to the untreated condition so that's interesting and useful but it's a pretty small um, um, area that was treated and uh, it's not necessarily representative of all the different types of jobs that have been done since that time. Um, a more typical uh, type of project that there have been many of these done is uh, applications on uh, historic uh, bridges. Uh, this happens to be one from Idaho DOT that I picked because I've got some photos that I can show you for the different um, installation steps. Um, this project was done in 2007 and it won a project of the year award from uh, or the project of the year award from uh, the International Conquer Repair Institute. Uh, this bridge was built in 1933. It's on the National Register of Historic Places and the main objectives of the restoration were to improve the safety rating for the bridge and to do a historical restoration that minimized the change in the historic nature of, of the bridge itself. The main area that was treated with chloride extraction was the concrete arch. Uh, some of the spandrel columns were also treated, but the main area was the concrete arch and, uh, and it was chloride contaminated and corroding. Um, at the time the treatment was done, the amount of concrete damage on the arch was limited. There was there were concrete repairs that were required and they were completed prior to doing chloride extraction, but the majority of the arch was in good uh, condition and that's important for electrochemical chloride extraction because if you have too much in the way of repairs to do, it will become uh, cost prohibitive um, because you're going to have to do those repairs and it may not satisfy the historic uh, maintaining the historic significance either um, the work was done in accordance with the NACE standard and the system ran um, for approximately eight weeks in this case so just to walk you through a typical installation um, here you see the access uh, systems been installed uh, on the underside and to the sides of the arch when you do electrochemical chloride extraction or realkalization, we need to make electrical connections to the reinforcing steel. And that's what's happening in this photograph. They're drilling some holes to make connections to the rebar. And you're gonna need a need, we generally recommend a minimum of two connections to the rebar for every uh, approximately 1,000 square feet or 100 square meters of concrete surface area. After the anode is installed, um, the temporary uh, conductive media is applied. Here you can see spraying of the uh, paper mache type material 
that provides electrical contact between the anode mesh and the surface of the concrete. The, uh, after the system is installed and the wiring is connected, in most cases, we will either cover or wrap the installed system with plastic. That's useful because it minimizes evaporation. You don't need as much water to keep it wet. And also things stay more uniformly wet and you tend to get a more uniform treatment as a result of that. So here you see it's been wrapped with plastic. Wires from the system are going to go back to rectifiers. We'll talk about that later, but these are basically power supplies that convert AC power to low voltage DC uh, that goes to the structure. The negative wires go to the reinforcing steel. The positive wires go to the anode mesh. Here's a picture of what the structure looks like um, or looked like when it was being treated. Um, you can see the access scaffold and some tarps on there to uh, protect it from the wind. Um, and then at the end of the treatment, that's taken down. Now, um, that's a project that was done um, you know, a few years ago. Um, there have been and there continue to be a number of historic bridges where this is used. Uh, we just finished uh, last late last fall a uh, project for uh, Caltrans, California Department of Transportation, um, on a multi-span arch bridge out on the Pacific Coast Highway. And uh, same idea of what you saw in uh, Idaho project except on a on a larger scale. And so here's a picture of the bridge and on the right you can see during construction when they had all the access scaffolding installed. OK, not all bridges that are done with chloride extraction are historic um, concrete arch bridges. Certainly some are, but uh, uh, some are very normal, <laughs> typical looking bridges. Um, and I just wanted to show you one example of that. This is the Vine Street Viaduct in um, Pennsylvania. It's in uh, Philadelphia. Um, and these are just traditional uh, overpass structures over the freeway with the uh, flat pier walls. You can see one in the distance. You can see one here where the deck has been removed. And this was a, pro a PennDOT project which involved accelerated bridge uh, construction or accelerated bridge replacement. They replaced the deck and superstructure on seven bridges along this section and they repaired and they wanted to extend the service life of the existing abutments so that they had a service life similar to the new decks that they were installing. Um, so that's another good reason to use chloride extraction or other similar techniques. Um, so Structure is not an arch bridge, but the installation is similar. Conquer repairs first, if any. Installation of the anode mesh, installation of your electrolyte media, covering it with plastic, putting in drippers to keep it wet, wires going back to a rectifier, which you can monitor and measure. And if you look on the right side here, you can see the wall is just sitting there. Traffic can continue to flow. All of that can happen while the treatment is going on. And at the end, when it's done, they can come in with a nighttime lane closure, remove the existing superstructure, drop in the new beams, and form and pour the new concrete deck. So it this type of system can be very well incorporated into um, bridge deck replacements or superstructure replacements where you want to maintain the existing substructure. And that's what I wanted to show in this uh, uh, project example. Um, so I could show you some more chloride extraction examples, but in one form or another, they're going to look kind of the same. Um, so I thought I would change gears at this point and uh, talk a little bit about realkalization. Um, and the project that I picked to illustrate this is a project that we did a few years ago for uh, Oregon DOT. It's called the Dry Canyon um, Bridge. It was built back in, uh, well, it was finished in 1921 and opened to traffic. Um, it actually was built a couple of, took a 
couple or a few years before that to get it done. It's also a historic bridge. It looks really well, more beautiful than it did during construction. Um, and this is a picture of it before the restoration project, um, 90 something years after the bridge was constructed. And it is or it was deteriorating at that point in time. Um, but the deterioration here is not because of corrosion due to chlorides. The deterioration here is because of corrosion due to carbonation of the concrete. So concrete exposed to carbon dioxide from the air. You will have a natural reduction in the alkalinity of the concrete. Um, here you have an old structure. So the older it is, the more carbonation is going to affect you. And the second thing is that um, you have relatively porous um, or you could say low quality concrete um, because of the how it was made at the time and that type of concrete is more susceptible to carbonation just because it's more porous to carbon dioxide. Um, so in this particular situation they did conquer repairs where necessary um, where there was existing concrete damage same as you would for chloride extraction but then they installed and in, um, did realkalization as opposed to chloride extraction. Realkalization um, schematically looks the same as chloride extraction. Um, you have a system applied to the surface of the concrete, the surface that you wish to treat. Um, over on the left side, you have it connected to a DC power supply. The negative side is connected to the rebar. The positive side is connected to the temporary anode. Here, instead of using water, to keep the system wet, we norm we use an alkaline electrolyte. Um, so we're wetting this system with an alkaline solution. And when you turn the power on, you still generate alkali around the rebar like you do with chloride extraction, but you also draw this alkaline electrolyte into the concrete. Um, you run the system for a period of time until you completely realkalize or increase the pH of the carbonated concrete layer that is typically, or in this case, is on the surface of the existing concrete structure. Uh, when you have achieved this, and generally you will take some cores to verify that it's realkalized. Um, after you've verified that, then the system is removed and you're left with the structure without a permanent system installed. Same as chloride extraction in that sense. Um, so here's a picture uh, taken during construction um, and you can see the beautiful arch ribs um, here, but they're covered with the realkalization system and then wrapped in plastic. Um, so conceptually it looks kind of the same as chloride extraction, probably other than the fact that instead of keeping it wet with water, we're keeping it wet with an alkaline solution. The main difference here is the treatment time. Realkalization takes a matter of days, typically, as opposed to weeks. And so the treatment time here was six days. Um, typically, um, it would be somewhere between four and seven days in most cases, whereas chloride extraction will take, for this type of structure, six to eight weeks instead of six or seven days. Um, when the system is finished running, um, all of that temporary material that's on the surface is removed. Um, the surface of the concrete was uh, grit blasted and a protective coating was applied. Um, that, if it's acceptable, aesthetically acceptable um, with the preservation people in your area is, is really good because um, it does hide the appearance of any concrete repairs that you had to do um, to repair existing areas of concrete damage. And it also provides you some additional um, protection and waterproofing of the concrete surface, not to exclude the fact that the concrete also, it looks good. Um, at the beginning of the webinar, Scott mentioned about um, the fact that we have a calculator online um, to help you do this. Uh, I'm very, very interested in the area of sustainability, and I think it's, a, it's an important 
thing that we need to keep in mind. Um, it's not more important than the technical aspects, but it is up there with the technical aspects of the jobs that we do. In this particular case, um, the structure, the intent was to protect it for at least 25 and hopefully 50 or more years. Um, I think they will achieve that um, quite easily. Um, and by keeping this structure in service, you know, a whole bunch of concrete was, min was maintained in service and not that amount of concrete did not have to be demolished and replaced with something similar um, to simply have a bridge at that location. Now, this is not a huge bridge. It's a single span, it's relatively short single span, even compared to the uh, Idaho DOT rainbow bridge that we saw earlier. But still, there's 1,400 cubic yards of concrete there. Um, that's quite a bit of concrete rubble. And the amount of CO2 to make an equivalent amount of concrete, if you replace this bridge with a similar kind of bridge, is about 700 tons of CO2. And, you know, just using that as one way to uh, illustrate environmental impact, that's equivalent to the annual emissions of approximately 140 people, which is about the number of people that are on this webinar here this afternoon. And, uh, and this is a relatively small bridge and it's one of you know, many, many projects that we get involved with every year. And for all of you on the webinar, um, a lot of your firms and a lot of your agencies are doing many, many times this amount of uh, work you know, not only every year, but in some cases every week. And uh, what we can do to keep structures and service has env environmental benefits um, as much as it has uh, moral and uh, and psychological benefits as well. Um, as Scott mentioned, there is a calculator on the website and, uh, and uh, this is a screenshot here from the calculator. You can enter basically your quantities and whatever, and it'll give you an idea of not only the amount of carbon dioxide footprint, but also the materials that are used in making that amount of concrete, the amount of water that's required, etc. And um, yeah, hopefully you can find that useful and you can uh, use it um, beneficially for, for your projects as you go along. Um, okay, I'm going to switch back to chloride extraction and just talk a little bit about long-term performance. And I thought I would close out the seminar by talking about long term performance from two projects that were done uh, quite a few years ago. The first one, a um, bridge deck project in Virginia that was done in 1995 and Scott already pointed out the black and white photo there. So I've put it again here on the it's on the left of this slide. And the second project is uh, Manitoba DOT um, project that was done in 1998, which involved uh, chloride extraction on the substructure of this bridge. And uh, I made that project, I made that photo black and white just so it would match the one on the left. So if we talk about the VDOT deck project first, um, this was um, the first larger scale project that was done in the US. Um, uh, after the Burlington Skyway project that was done there. Uh, this was 1995 and VDOT together with Federal Highway Administration decided to to do chloride extraction on two spans of a five span bridge that goes over I-395 in Arlington, Virginia. And, and the picture you see here, this is a picture of span number five. Um, the last span at the one end of the bridge, and you can see that they did conquer repairs, um, which they did in, as required in all of the spans um, prior to doing uh, chloride extraction on this span and the span next to it, span four, and the other three spans, they did the conquer repairs the same, but didn't do uh, any of the chloride extraction, obviously. Um, the system that was used here uh, is typical of what's used on decks. Um, bridge and parking or other types of decks. Um, instead of the paper mache material, it's using felt. Um, so we're basically rolling out a layer of felt. Um, the anode 
in this case was a titanium mesh anode. You can see a roll of it back here in the distance. That's laid out on top of the felt, and then another layer of felt is rolled out on top of that. Um, and then uh, that whole system is covered with plastic to minimize evaporation. Um, you can see it systems installed in the background here on span four, and the system's just being installed on span three or span five. Um, the wires from the system go to the rectifiers that are in the trailer here, um, and that's what powers the two sections that are being or will be treated. Um, and here you can see the system installed here on span four, and this is before the system was installed, installed on span five down there. Because this was um, kind of the first project that they did in the area and Federal Highways was involved, they, they sponsored an open house that was held on site while during the time that the treatment was going on. Um, and so a bunch of uh, Federal Highway and State Bridge and consulting engineers came out to site and toured it, took a look, kicked the tires, and uh, a number of people that attended this open house went on to do other projects in, in other states as well. Um, earlier this year, um, uh, a company that does non-destructive testing using infrared thermography, a company called Nexco West, um, went out and did an infrared thermography survey of the bridge deck um, of the entire uh, structure, all decks. And um, the image that you see on the top here is the raw uh, thermography data. Um, the image that you see in the middle here is where they've identified the delaminations by from the infrared data. And they also, as part of this project, did a chain drag survey on all of the decks and they marked out the areas of delamination by chain drag. And uh, there's really two things that I want to point out on this. One is uh, when I saw this data, I was, I was really surprised and impressed how closely the chain drag data matched up with the infrared thermography data. I thought that was really, really positive. And then um, the second thing that um, obviously jumped out at me was in the two spans where chloride extraction was done, there's basically no conch repairs. And uh, this is after being out there for uh, uh, 25, 26 years now. And uh, and uh, and it's obviously very different compared to the untreated spans, which had the same repairs done back at the same time. So there's there's a significant uh, difference there in terms of the performance. Um, and the final uh, project example I wanted to show with regard to uh, illustrating some long term performance for chloride extraction and in this case also impressed current cathodic protection is a project that we were involved with with um, Manitoba um, infrastructure and transportation as it's called up here um, back in 1998. Um, this bridge that you see on the right was built in 1959. It's a four span bridge cast in place concrete deck and substructure sitting on uh, steel girders. In 1998, um, the DOT did conch repairs to all of the piers of this structure. Um, in 1998, um, we also installed, we also did chloride extraction on one of the piers as a trial project. And then four years later, um, the DOT had us come back and we did, we installed an impressed current cathodic protection system on one of the other piers. In fact, it was this middle pier here. And uh, this photograph is from 2002 when the ICE in impressed current cathodic protection trial was being installed. Um, we've talked a lot about chloride extraction, so I'm not going to show you pictures of that. It looks exactly the same, or the pictures of this project look the same as others I've shown. Uh, we haven't talked about impressed current cathodic protection in this webinar, so I thought I'd put in one slide to give you an overview. Um, there are 
a wide range of different types of systems out there, but the system that was used in this in this trial installation um, involved discrete anodes, basically rod type conductive ceramic anodes that were installed in drilled holes into the piers with wires that ran from here back in slots all the way to the power supply. Um, in 2013, um, so 15 years after the conch repairs were done and 15 years after the uh, chloride extraction pier was treated, um, the DOT did a deck replacement project on this structure. And at that time, they also did another round of conch repairs for the substructure. And, uh, and so just to try and put this into perspective, um, so all the piers were repaired in 1998 and on the control pier um, where nothing was done since that time, they did 250 square meters or almost 2,700 square feet of concrete repairs. Um, if we jump all the way to the bottom on the pier where they did concrete repairs in 1998 and chloride extraction in 1998 as well, um, they only had nine and a half square meters of repairs or about 100 square feet. You know, that's according to the math here, it's about you know 96% significant reduction in repairs. Um, the chloride or the impressed current pier um, also had a significant reduction in the amount of repairs compared to the control. It wasn't as good as the chloride extraction, and I'm not here to say that impressed current isn't as good because uh, it all depends on how you run the system. Um, we installed this system, we monitored it uh, for a couple of years, and then um, the DOT took over and I know for a fact that when we came back to do the the work in 2013 that the impressed current system was not running at that time so how long it was off for I don't know but um, I suspect the fact that this is higher than this is really because that system probably wasn't maintained and um, certainly wasn't running consistently for the whole time that it was installed. So um, just in terms of conclusions, um, at least in terms of the long-term monitoring, um, chloride extraction does provide um, long-term uh, corrosion protection. It has the benefit that there's no permanent system there that requires maintenance or monitoring. Um, it does um, at the same time have other limitations, obviously, like any other system does. Um, impressed current is also beneficial and effective um, as you saw from the last uh, case study, but it does require ongoing monitoring and maintenance. And if that would have been completed, um, uniformly provided, I think the performance um, would have been better than in the last case study. And uh, regardless what type of system you use, if you don't do anything at all and you just allow things to corrode, um, corrosion will accelerate over time and eventually you're going to get to the situation where you need either to do major, major repairs or possibly complete replacement of the structure. And that's probably not the most cost effective approach to managing your asset inventory. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for your time and uh, spending the time on this webinar. We've uh, left a few minutes here for questions and I'd be happy to answer them as we go. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Dave. Um, we have some questions here. I guess maybe one comment for me. I mean, people that are not as familiar with some of this technology uh, may think of this as kind of magical to apply electrical current to steel. But when you show, when you bring the receipts, so to speak, of long-term performance that's been monitored and documented, uh, it makes it a lot more real. So um, that's a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Uh, we have a bunch of questions here. Uh, I'm not sure where to start here. Let me just let me start with one of my own because we've been doing these webinars for now 10 months and we've explored lots of different technology on how to extend the service life of bridges and, and preserve assets. Where does this tool fit into that mix? Because we've heard about, you've mentioned impressed current cathodic protection today and we've talked about galvanic solutions. We talked about fusion solutions. In your sense, where does this fit in? 
Um, well, this this has certain advantages. It also has certain limitations compared to some of these other options that you've mentioned. I think one of the main advantages is that this is a temporary, this is a system that is temporarily installed and then is completely removed. So for things like historic structures, things where you've got aesthetic surfaces or architectural kind of surfaces or Im implications, this is seriously something to think about because this isn't going to change the appearance of the structure. Um, and any of those other systems are going to change it in some way, even if it's where you're drilling holes and putting things in drilled holes, there will be some change there. I think the other uh, thing here that's a benefit is that there's no system to maintain. That's definitely an issue related that will come up more with impressed current systems. That is less of a determining factor if you think about galvanic systems or fusion type systems. Um, so there's a range of things there that'll help you to decide. I think one place where this, in most cases, you probably would not use this is if you have a structure that has a huge amount of existing concrete damage, you've probably lost your economic window where this makes sense. It, you either have to do so much conquer repairs that this becomes non-economical, or you have to do so much conquer repairs or resurfacing that you've lost the aesthetic benefit of saving the existing surface. Um, and so, you know, if you've got severely deteriorated structures, then you probably, at least for those areas, should think about a different uh, solution like a galvanic encasement or something else as opposed to chloride extraction or realkalization. It's too far gone. Very good. Um, over to a question from our friend Guido. Um, just as a kind of I'll paraphrase, but can you comment on um, uh, like the the need for patch repair on a structure and the impact ECE has on it uh, in terms of the decision? But also his second question, I'll just add to that is, does the repair material have any impact on this? No, that's a good. That's a good question. Um, Okay, so let, let's just step back. Maybe I'll answer the second question first. Um, if you're doing conquer repairs, and let's say we're doing proper conquer repairs as per like ICRI type guidelines, where we're chipping fully around the reinforcing steel, we're removing the chloride contaminated concrete or maybe carbonated concrete from contacting the reinforcing steel, and we're pouring back concrete or sh shot creating concrete back, whatever. In that situation, honestly, you can probably use almost anything for the conquer repairs that you want. Uh, the resistivity of the repair material probably doesn't really matter, even if it's very high, because you're unless you're trying to treat a second layer of rebar beyond that first layer of rebar, the first layer of rebar is going to be in new concrete within the repair area. You're really doing the electrical electrochemical treatment for the areas outside of the patches. So some of the other restraints that you would have were, you know, if you're putting anodes into the repair or doing cathodic protection within or through a repair, you would want the resistivity below a certain number. Um, that probably wouldn't exist in these cases um, uh, if you're removing all of the steel from being in contact with chloride contaminated concrete within the footprint of the repair area. Okay, the um, next question relates to time. So uh, first, uh, can you speak to the treatment time for both uh, realkalization as well as uh, chloride extraction on different parts of the structure, whether it's overhead or vertical surfaces? Uh, okay, that's a good question. Um, OK, so in general, um, chloride extraction is going to take, uh, let's just say, four to eight weeks as a general time frame. You can have situations that are shorter or longer than that. Um, if you have something like a deck, an upward facing surface that you can saturate and keep very, very wet, uniformly wet, um, you're probably more in that four to six week, the shorter end of that time frame. For vertical and overhead surfaces, um, you can keep them wet, but you can never keep them fully saturated in the same way as you can pond the surface of a deck. 
uh, the treatment is going to be a little slower and in those applications you're usually looking at I would say six to eight weeks as a typical treatment time. Um, I think the only other comment about vertical and overhead, it, you saw a lot of vertical uh, examples in the project examples. Um, that's very common to do. Uh, if you are doing overhead, um, even like the underside of the arch in, in a couple of those arch bridge examples or pier caps, um, you do have to support the, the system um, because you don't want it sagging down and losing contact with the surface during the treatment. So uh, that is something that you will have to do, but it won't change the treatment time. All right, another question around time. Um, once treated, both for realkalization and chloride extraction, um, what typically can you expect the re-ingress of, say, chloride uh, in one case and carbonation in the other to be? Is there any kind of residual protective benefit? Yeah, um, I would say more than half of the jobs that are done um, with either chloride extraction or realkalization have some type of coating applied after they're done and the coating would definitely provide an additional benefit in terms of chloride contamination or carbonation of the concrete. Um, uh, so that's that's one thing there. I mean, obviously the worst case scenario, the most conservative scenario would be that, you know, concrete would become re-chloride contaminated, you know, similar to that it was before. Um, that might mean it might take 20, 30, 40, whatever years for chlorides to get back in there, um, depending on the application and exposure. I think the reality is that the migration or permeation of chlorides back into the concrete is actually slower than it was initially because there's some filling of the pores that happens as a result of the treatment process. Um, in the case of realkalization, if you are able to realkalize all the way down to and beyond, like past the first mat of rebar, um, you are realkalizing the alkaline electrolyte that you're using is alkaline and that electrolyte is also already carbonated. So um, that will have a very, very high resistance to recarbonation, much more than the original concrete did. Fantastic. We just have one time for one more question. It's really hard to pick because there's a bunch that just came in. Um, it goes to uh, our friend Juan from, uh, from Montreal. Uh, among these techniques, uh, which is the technique that uh, that can repair heavily corroded and spalled concrete? Uh, I, I assume neither of these can do that, uh, but what is the limit to material damage? What's the limit to uh, repairs that you would recommend for both using chloride extraction and realkalization? Um, from If you're only thinking of just from an economic point of view, I, I would say at maximum, you probably you would be 25% repair area. Um, maybe a, maybe even a little less than that. Um, uh, if you're thinking about historic, uh, something of historic significance, you might tolerate a slightly higher percentage of repairs just because you're trying to save whatever you can of the existing material, even if it turns out it's less than say 75%. Um, but generally speaking, if you've got a significant repair uh, percentage of repair area, uh, you're probably better off to go with something like a galvanic encasement or some other type of um, overlay or overbuild and do the conquer repair and corrosion protection all in one step as opposed to having to do two steps. One of doing conquer repairs and then coming back with a second um, procedure to do chloride extraction or realkalization if you have a lot of repairs to do. Thank you, Dave. Um, I apologize to everyone. There's still more questions coming in that we were not able to get to, but uh, I know Dave would love to hear from you and he can answer all your questions one-on-one -on -one if you're able to send him an email or give him a ring at the phone number and email address on your screen. I'll leave it up there for just a second here. Um, and feel free to reach out to anyone at the Vector Corrosion Technologies team if you have questions about chloride extraction or realkalization. We are, I'm sure, happy to help. As I mentioned, upcoming June 9th, uh, surface applied cathodic protection of substructures with Travis Marmon. 
and July 14th, uh, culvert repair using geopolymer mortars with uh, Garth Fallis. And that concludes our bridge preservation series. So if you have feedback for us and what you'd like to see in upcoming webinars, please do reach out at communications at wesavestructures.com. That brings us to the end of today's webinar. I want to thank again Dave Whitmore for joining us today and sharing your expertise and your, your dear love of uh, electrochemical treatments. We appreciate you uh, spending the time. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Scott. Thank you everyone for attending this afternoon. And obviously we thank all of you for joining us and, and dedicating your time uh, to learning a little bit about these new technologies. Uh, well, not so new anymore, technologies here today. Um, be safe, take care of yourselves and your families, uh, get vaccinated and, uh, and uh, go out there and save some structures. We look forward to seeing you soon.